Welcome to today's CMM webinar brought to you by our publisher, ISSA, and our sponsors, Cascade Pro, TBS Capital Funding, and Steramis by Tomi Environmental Solutions. I'm CMM Managing Editor, Amy Richardson, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Thank you for joining us. CMM offers many resources for our facility managers, in-house service providers, and building service contractors. Visit cmmonline.com to subscribe to our magazine and sign up for our daily news, and be sure to connect with us on Twitter and Facebook. Here are a few things to keep in mind before we get started. We encourage you to submit questions at any point during today's program in the Q&A box on your screen. Our panelists will answer as many as time allows during the Q&A session after their presentations. Your audio will be automatically muted to avoid interruptions. All attendees will receive a recording of today's webinar by email. A recording will also be on our website for early next week. Thank you again for joining us today. Before we get started, let's hear a quick message from our sponsor, Cascades Pro. introduce our first speaker, Daryl Hicks. Daryl is a nationally recognized subject matter expert in infection prevention and control as it relates to cleaning. He is the past president of the Healthcare Services Institute in the IEHA. He is a certified healthcare environmental services professional, a master registered environmental services executive, and the owner principal of Safe, Clean, and Disinfected, an enterprise that offers B2B and facility consulting services related to cleaning and disinfection. Thank you for joining us today, Daryl. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Amy. I think that uh, I've been around the business long enough to say that uh, there is a disconnect between the terminology that we use in the business. And uh, so I wanted to just start out of the shoot here saying that uh, it's important that we get on the same page when it comes to terminology and uh, that Event, well, it's vitally important for communicating with those on the front lines of infection prevention, and that's the environmental services aides or associates. And uh, when we're educating those frontline workers, the e ESAs, we need to use terms that are easily understood. Uh, if I say the term clean or cleaning, uh, people have different ideas about what clean is. And uh, I used to ask someone in an interview, I said, so how would you define clean? And they say, well, you empty the trash and you wipe the windows and you uh, clean the toilet. And I said, those are steps of cleaning. What is clean? And uh, people ha have difficulty coming up with uh, a definition of clean. So we need to communicate clearly to those frontline uh, in infection preventionists. So we need to ensure that our written policies and procedures use similar professional terminology that is unique to your segment of the cleaning industry. I think that that is one thing that I would uh, encourage everyone in the uh, cleaning and disinfection business to, uh, to adopt new terms that uh, are more definitive than what we've used in the past. And it's really the sign of a true professional when you use terminology that uh, befits the, uh, the job that we're doing. Next slide. So cleaning for health, uh, there's cleaning versus hygienically clean. When we 
the unqualified use of the term cleaning should be avoided and communicating hygiene practices with your staff. So we need to avoid that, that term cleaning. And instead, we terms other than cleaning could be used to define this process and state of hygienic cleaning. Uh, so we use the terms hygienically clean or process or processing. And a process includes the elements of uh, microfiber wipers, uh, the facility approved disinfectant and uh, a process. So, you know, those elements have to be uh, a part of the term process or processing. So it's time to replace clean or cleaning with hygienic cleaning to refer to any process intended to reduce the number of pathogens on a surface to an acceptable target safety target level, which makes it fit for purpose. And fit for purpose on a floor in a uh, airport terminal is not the same as a floor in an operating room. So it doesn't need to meet uh, a higher standard. The one in the airport terminal doesn't meet to, need to meet that higher standard of a uh, clean disinfected environment in uh, where they're doing open heart surgeries. So you have to look at the fit for purpose. How's that, uh, that room or that piece of equipment going to be used? And uh, that's the safety target level. It might only be cleaning that is necessary and not uh, disinfecting. So next slide, slide. So we're here to talk today about uh, the intersection of hands and surfaces. We have to have clean hands touching clean surfaces. And uh, then when you touch those clean surfaces, you don't have to worry about touching your face and uh, your nose and your mouth. Uh, but there are elements of uh, hand hygiene, they're listed here. So in order for hand hygiene to be efficacious, and I'm not talking about uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizers because that is uh, like an interim measure, not the goal of clean uh, hands. But why is it that we talk about clean, what makes uh, hygienically clean hands different than hygienically clean surfaces? So we have clean running water. I know that over in, uh, in West Ghana, wherever they were battling Ebola, and people, uh, you know, they did have hand washing facilities, but it consisted of a bucket of water and a bar of soap. And uh, so you wanted to be the first person to use that, that bucket of water and not the last person because by the time four or five people wash their hands and you're just spreading things around on your hands. So you have to have clean running water, you have to have soap, and you don't doesn't necessarily, and I, I would uh, advise against uh, bacterial, um, antimicrobial soaps or antibacterial soaps uh, because of some of the issues with that, but just regular soap because the agitation is what's going to, uh, to work and loosen the soil uh, on the hands. And it takes some time. And, you know, we, we have, through COVID, we have, uh, you know, been kind of beat over the head about this hand washing and hand hygiene. But, uh, you know, we talk about the time it takes and uh, whether it's a birthday song a couple of times or singing the alphabet to yourself, Whatever it is, you have to have time in order for that agitation to really loosen the soil. And attention to places where germs hide, under your fingernails, on your wrist, in between your fingers, and especially uh, at your wrist. And uh, you see people washing their hands with their wristwatch on or with bracelets on, and they're afraid to get them wet. And but the wrists need to be uh, washed and cleaned at the same time. And then there's thorough rinsing with clean running water, and then drying with a clean paper towel. And I'm not an advocate of uh, electric hand dryers in uh, in restrooms and 
that paper towel will finish off whatever uh, soils may be remaining uh, after all of this process. The paper towel is that final wipe uh, of the, the skin on the hands and uh, wrist. Next slide. So if we use those same uh, elements in cleaning and disinfection, so here are six steps to environmental hygiene. So efficacious environmental hygiene should include these elements. And you'll see the similarities between this and the hand hygiene. Uh, first of all, clean microfiber wiper or flat mop, a general purpose cleaner with pH of seven to nine, uh, elbow grease, agitation. And this is something that I was teaching a, a class and uh, had a young person raise her hand and said, where do I buy elbow grease? And she just got a laugh from some of the older people in the classroom because that's what we have called, uh, you know, putting some umph into it. So you have to give some pressure to that, uh, to that microfiber wiper or flat mop and not just a, a quick swipe. So there has to be a little bit of elbow grease, some agitation, and we have to pay attention to where the germs hide along crevices, ends of uh, tables and what have you. But you have to have kind of microbiologist uh, vision and see where those germs might hide. Uh, when the surface is dry, apply a sporocidal hospital grade disinfectant and must remain wet for 60 to 90 seconds. And the reason I say this is that sporocidal, uh, I think is the benchmark disinfectant, uh, wherever you are providing uh, these cleaning and disinfection services, that sporocidals are the highest level. And because it kills spores such as C. diff, it also will kill everything underneath there, the envelope, the non-envelope, lipid, non-lipid, all those and the viruses as well. So uh, in the 60 to 90 seconds, I know that the label may state differently, but uh, when those disinfectants are registered uh, for EPA registration, uh, when they go through the AOAC test, that uh, there is no agitation on those stainless steel titers that they uh, dip into the disinfectant. So I'm just saying that uh, because we have cleaned the surface, uh, gotten rid of the soil, and that's another step is that uh, these disinfectants that are registered uh, with a 5% soil load, uh, it's once we get the surface clean, then you, you don't have the disinfectant fighting the active ingredients in the disinfectant fighting the soil on the surface. But then this last step is rinse with clean water and wipe dry since many disinfectants are corrosive to surface materials and or leave a visible film when dry. I know there are some disinfectants that, uh, that are much kinder to surfaces, but some of the legacy disinfectants we've been using for years have uh, damaged beyond repair a lot of surfaces in not just in healthcare, but throughout society. And, you know, it always uh, hurts me whenever I go into a public restroom and you see the chrome on the sinks just gone because they used uh, acid-based bowl cleaners on the faucets. Next slide. And finally, here's a phrase you need to remove from your PMPs, your policies and procedures and your education. Get rid of the phrase, clean when visibly soiled. The data show that potentially unsafe levels of pathogens can remain on visibly clean surfaces. And here's something that you perhaps didn't know, but fecal matter the size of a pinhead contains sufficient material to transmit C. difficile. And, uh, so when you instruct your staff to clean touch points or are visibly soiled, are they looking for soil the size of a pinhead? And I say no. So I 
I think that we need to get rid of this term and it shouldn't, I don't think it should be on a, a disinfectants label. I think that we should assume with the viruses and uh, spores such as C. diff, uh, and C. diff isn't just in hospitals, you can be uh, cultured in public restrooms and out in uh, the public. So we need to be aware of that and we need to just clean, pre-clean surfaces, follow those, uh, those six steps of hygienically uh, cleaning surfaces. Next slide. Thank you. All right, thanks, Daryl. Um, I'd like to remind our audience, you can submit questions for the Q&A throughout the program. So if you have any questions for Daryl, please go ahead and submit those and we'll get to them um, after our second speaker today. Before we turn the program over to Mike, let's hear from our sponsor, TBS Capital Funding. This stinks. You know what stinks even more? Unstable cash flow. Waiting 30, 60, or even 90 days to get paid by your clients can affect your ability to buy supplies, pay your vendors, advertise, make payroll, so much more. That's where we come in. TBS Capital Funding pays you same day for your invoices so you can focus on the important things like daily operations, building client relationships, and developing your business. Let TBS Capital Funding clean up your cash flow. All right, now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Mike Canales. Mike has worked as a healthcare facilities director for 21 years. He currently serves as the program director for the healthcare facilities leadership degree program at Owensboro Community and Technical College in Kentucky. Mike has been a longtime American Society for Healthcare Engineering member. He is a certified healthcare facility manager and is a founding member and past president of the Virginia Society of Healthcare Engineers. Welcome, Mike. Well, thank you, Amy, and thank you for allowing me to present. Um, I'm excited. Um, we're going to talk today about how the physical environment intersects with the users in the environment. I mean, speaking at a pretty high level, you know, the physical environment, there's a lot that we've done over the years and even more so in recent years, and I think in the future, to really change in the environment to better protect the patients. In 2007, there was a report that came out that said there were, was it 1.7 million folks had healthcare associated infections with 99,000 deaths. We've improved to about 750,000 infections, and I think it's approximately 75,000 deaths annually. It's still an extraordinarily high number, but we've made a lot of changes. We have a long way to go, and it's a, it's a long fight. It's a long journey. On the next slide, I want to go over the objectives, and it's going to be pretty high-level objectives. First, we're going to talk about the introduce. We're going to introduce the means of transmission from a physical environment perspective and the chain of infection. We're going to talk about ventilation at a very high level. We're also going to talk about the complexities of Installing alcohol-based hand rubs. It's really complex and it's good for the user to know some of the complexities we have to deal with because these alcohol-based hand rubs are basically incendiaries. And then we're going to touch on the importance of hand washing and sink placement. On the next slide, we're going to be talking about the chain of infection. We're going to be talking about one area. Each of these links, if you could disrupt each of these links, you can stop infection. So for example, the agent itself that exists in the environment, if you can eliminate it, you could stop it. The reservoirs where it grows, the exit, if you prevent it from leaving, the transmission, and that's what we're gonna primarily talk about today, or entry, or somehow if you could to have the host themselves somehow be protected. Most of us protect because we're not immunocompromised, but in healthcare, most folks are immunocompromised and some are severely immunocompromised. On the next slide, I want to talk about that for just a moment. When you look at the top of this chart, the healthy person, when we get exposed to something in the environment, we may get just a little bit of an allergic reaction. We might sniff, we may cough, you know, we might get a runny nose. But, and again, if you go down this list, you see surgery, you see chronic obstructive steroids, and the further you get down the list, the more immunocompromised you get, the more severe the reaction will be to what is normal in our environment. When you get down to bone marrow transplant, where they've wiped out their immune system, they're highly vulnerable to almost any kind of infection. On the next slide, what I want to do is I want to talk about the means of transmission from three modes. There's contact, we talk direct and indirect, airborne, and surface. So contact, direct, and indirect, you're most familiar with. We talked about hand washing until we're exhausted. But there's also this thing called incidental contact or indirect, where we touch things in between. You know, one of the things when I used to monitor folks is when you're like in a... Um, a recovery room of an OR and there's five beds, six beds next to each other and they're taking temperatures. And between each temp, they record 
on a chart and they go back and forth and back and forth. And we used to watch them. And it was so hard for them to pass that monitor because obviously they touch the thermometer, they go to the patient, they go to the board, and then they go to the next patient. And do they wash in between every incidental contact? Very difficult. You know, airborne is another one. We talk about in the air, what's in the air. We talk about humidity levels, talk about coughing and sneezing, you know, air exchanges of the air moving in the environment. That's another way we deal with transmission. And then there's surfaces, which is, you've had a lot of conversation about surfaces. I'm sure you've heard lots about surfaces, but when it comes to facilities, you know, we've changed, we don't use wallpaper in rooms anymore. We know that the glue in the paper is food. You know, we, we even learned recently that stainless steel has issues. So we don't use that as much. You know, counters and shelves, we're infusing them with, uh, with copper, or we certainly know we're not meant to use wood. You know, flooring, we use monolithic flooring, which is just completely to the wall, no more cove base, so there's no gaps and cracks, and it rolls up to the wall. On the next slide, we're going to talk about aspergillus a little bit, because this is one of the core issues in physical environment. It's basically anything that decays. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing what is aspergillus, or what looks like dust, that we you just swabbed a handicap button and grew it in a Petri dish that has what moisture, food, and temperature. And you can see this growth. Imagine this inside of an immunocompromised lung that can't fight the spore and growth in its lung. On the next slide, you're going to be shocked at looking at the sole of a shoe. Again, this is just taking that dust off the sole of a shoe. Again, it's, it's ubiquitous in nature, ubiquitous around us. So it just gives you an idea of how it can affect folks and how things can grow if it has the right environment and the person's immuno, or immunocompromised and is weak enough. And keep in mind in healthcare, we have more highly acute folks than ever because folks are being sent home very quickly now. We only keep very sick people in the, in, in the healthcare facilities. Next slide. On the next slide, we're gonna now switch over to ventilation. Ventilation is a big part of what we do in physical environment design. And next slide, please. And in the physical environment, I want you to see this chart. This chart, which I say ASHRAE 170 2017, believe it or not in healthcare, there are 85 unique spaces with all kinds of specialized ventilation requirements, whether it's temperature, or it's humidity, or it's fresh air, or it's mixed air, or it's air exchanges, a mix of fresh and, you know, we, again, 85 unique type spaces in healthcare is how we design. We try to dilute the air. On the next slide, I wanna look at a, on the next slide, we're gonna be looking at this list here that shows some of these unique spaces. Okay, this is a list of the different areas with different unique spaces. Now we're gonna look at a couple of very unique spaces on the next slide. The first one is gonna be an airborne isolation infection room. In this room, which we do is we do all kinds of things like 12 air exchanges with two fresh air outside exchanges. On the third line, you see minus 0 0.01 water column, negative pressure. We try it again. We've heard a lot about negative pressure it relates to the rooms. We try to maintain negative pressure to keep the people in the hallway or outside the room protected from what's going on in the room. And this air is 100% exhausted out of the space. That 0 0.01 water column is extremely critical because here's the thing. It only accounts for undercuts of doors as far as leakage. If you have a door open, a window open, something open, you've lost all of your differential, you've lost your air exchanges, now you've got all kinds of mixing of air, and you have no idea what you might be contaminating. On the next slide, we're looking at a positive protective environment. This is the opposite. We're protecting the patient. If you notice, the diffuser is flowing down across the patient and over towards the return or the exhaust. And on that third line there, you see plus 0 0.01 water column. Again, the opposite effect. We're trying to push the air away from the patient, over the patient, into the spaces outside of that space. On the next slide, we're gonna to be touching on a pandemic situation. This is what we dealt with in pandemic. We had to modify spaces. If you notice in the upper hand, we'd see the little X, that's where we closed off the return. So we didn't pull the air back into the system. And then we opened the window, we had a HEPA system that pulled air out and across the patient out of the room and going out. So you can see how on these, how we're using the physical environment, the design to protect patients and the occupants or the users or the employees of these facilities. On the next slide, we're gonna be talking about what is called the, the CDC purge table. If you look at the furthest left column, you see six and 12 and they're starred. Six represents a normal patient room. 12 represents an airborne isolation infection room or a protective environment. And what we're trying to see here is in the patient room, it takes 46 minutes to get to 99% efficacy. In other words, it takes that long to dilute this, the air. Mind you, this does not take droplets out of the space. It only just kind of, once the air dries and gets small enough, it'll take it. But in droplet form, it doesn't remove it, okay? So you should wait about 46 minutes before you go in there without PPE. With all the pressure to turn rooms over very quickly, this can be a challenge for us. If you notice, it's 69 minutes when you get to 99.9% .9 efficacy. 
When you go to 12 air exchanges, it's cut in half. It's linear. Again, a very interesting slide that a lot of folks don't even know about. And now we're going to move on to the next slide. We're going to shift to alcohol-based handrails. I talked about this earlier. ABHRs. Let's change the slide. What I want you to do, we're going to move this very quickly. There's lots of requirements for installing these because they're incendiaries. In other words, they are little explosives, little fire bombs that we have to be very careful about installing in the space. And by the time we're done, you're going to realize why. We got to monitor how much storage. We got to monitor the locations. We got to monitor, you know, how much we're allowed in a smoke compartment. You know, the way buildings are designed in healthcare in smoke compartments. Next slide. On the next slide, it shows uh, we're going to talk about what is a smoke compartment. Again, it's a space on a floor so you can move patients or residents, if you will, horizontally without having to get them out of the building or take them down to another floor. So we have these boxes on every floor. Next slide. So those are smoke compartments. Now, if you look at a smoke compartment, this is some of the specifications of it, how, how big it can be, how far it can be from an exit. Recently, they allowed us to make them bigger. We went from 22,500 to new design. We can go to 40,000. And we could also, with sprinklers and everything, we can go 200 feet to an exit. On the next slide, we're going to touch on the, look, this is just an example. You look at all these colors. These are different smoke compartments on a floor. And each one of these has separate kind of doors, separate kind of barriers. But within each of these smoke compartments, we have a limited amount of ABHR we're allowed to install. Next slide, please. And so the next slide shows us, again, that this is more specifications on suites. Suites are spaces within a space of a hospital. And even within those, we have some restrictions. So they loosen up a little bit on alcohol-based hand rubs. Moving on. And this is some of the installation specifications. Again, our corridor width must be a minimum of six foot. We only allowed 41 ounces maximum, okay, of a size of a dispenser. If it's an aerosol, it's 18 ounces. Max gallons of 10 gallons in the whole smoke compartment. That's storage and otherwise, unless it's, in a, it's a cabinet. One dispenser in a room doesn't count, thank God. We're allowed to put more than one dispenser in a room and not count it for the aggregate of the smoke compartment. Um, the stock supply, we're limited to five gallons unless we follow some sort of special uh, containment, if you will. And we're not allowed to install it above a carpet unless there's special sprinklers. Next slide. Again, in suites, they give us a little more of a relaxed, uh, we're allowed a little more, 67 ounces. <laughs> and it's okay if the hallways are a little bit narrower inside of a suite. And I didn't talk about a suite earlier, but a suite, again, is a space, for example, like an ICU or a mother baby unit or something like that. They give us a little more lax because they know that's not an egress where people are going to try to get out of the building. You're going to get out of that suite very quickly. So they relax it just a little bit on us. Next slide. Again, and, and that's it for alcohol-based hand rubs. The last thing I wanted to talk about was a study that was done on the location of sinks and the implications when it comes to hand washing. So what they found was, is that the more, the further away it is, obviously, and the more times you have to make a turn, the lower the compliance when it comes to hand washing. And this is one of those things that it's, it's pretty simple when you have a patient room, but when you have a ward, or if you have, um, again, a large area, or if a, a person is moving, ambulating, like, was, like I was saying earlier, if they're working in a, um, let's say it's some kind of recovery room where there's, there's multiple beds, that the compliance goes down significantly. And you can't stress enough where the way we design healthcare has a lot to do with how we can protect the patients and the staff. And one of the things I wanted to really stress with this presentation is that there's an intersection between how the building's designed and how the user operates. For example, when it came to, um, let's say the, the uh, air ventilation, keeping doors closed, keeping windows closed, not having ceiling tiles removed or holes in ceiling tiles can affect the room. You know, when it came to the area of the chain of infection, one of the biggest things we can control is water. You know, most things need water to grow. And if we can mitigate water or moisture, then we can kind of slow down or stop the action of that, that spore or whatever that's growing. So things that we can do as folks working in the building that need to help the building and know that this is built around you to help you and help the patient. So there's a lot of design, like I said, and uh, I'm glad I was able to present this to you today. I hope you um, enjoyed it and I hope you have a few questions. Amy, it's yours. Thanks. Let's go back real quick here. Thanks, Mike. We will now hear from our sponsor, Steramis by Tomi Environmental Solutions, before we open up the program for a brief Q&A session. So please submit those questions now. Let's hear from Tomi.
right. Um, Daryl and Mike, we received some questions from the audience. And so we'll go ahead and address those now as time allows. And if you haven't yet, please go ahead and submit those questions now. Um, the first one we have is if everyone washed their hands just one more time, what impact would that have on overall health? What are your thoughts on that? Well, <clears throat> If surfaces are not treated to a hygienically clean level, then, um, you know, and that's usually a snapshot in 24 hour period, you know, when that cleaning disinfection happens, those six steps of hygienically clean uh, surface, you know, is just a snapshot in that 24 hour period. If it's not maintained by the occupants in that space, you know, through using disinfectant wipes, something else, uh, especially on those high touch surfaces, you could increase hand washing, you know, three times. Uh, and if it's touching uh, germy surfaces, then there's, uh, it negates the hand hygiene that's taking place. So it's really a, a two prong approach. It's clean hands touching clean surfaces. And uh, so if we're going to clean hands more frequently, then why don't we include surfaces, surface uh, processing at the same time in order to make that, uh, that hand hygiene more efficacious? Um, okay, so this is about the alcohol-based hand rubs. Um, regarding those, what about sanitizers that are in purchasing departments? There can be a higher volume that gets distributed throughout campus, um, for instance. Um, I, as far as I know, there's not a specific regulation on, um, you know, specific to what can be in a smoke bar, but, you know, when you come to cleaners and chemicals, those are meant to be stored in what are called hazardous spaces or hazardous storage rooms. And certainly if they were kept outside of those storage rooms, that would be an issue. But because those rooms are designed, again, usually with one hour rated walls and 45 minute rated doors and closers, you know, those, those, those terrible closers that you have to push through all the time to go in these storage rooms, that's why they're there because we know they're gonna house chemicals that could be flammable. And typically if you get too much uh, they were going to want it in some sort of a fire cabinet. And now you got to refer to the MSDS sheet and the flammability rating. So again, that that would be a possible. We don't keep those like stationed outside in corridors. Remember, corridors, we're supposed to get us out of the building and they're supposed to be clear of any clutter, supposed to be able to get people out and keep them safe. And that's why it's such a big issue in corridors specifically. And you don't you don't keep those cleaners, you know, in corridors. Okay. Um, the next question, I think um, you touched on this, Mike, but I'm sure both of you could speak to it. What are the most important things to focus on to avoid airborne tra transmission? Uh, the most important things to focus on. Gosh, that, that's that's a big subject. Um, you know, I would, I would say, you know, really maintaining the, the envelope of the room is a critical um, from my perspective. That's one thing people may not understand that if you open doors, open windows, even the building itself is pressurized where it's supposed to be pushing the air out of the building. And so people tend to open doors or keep doors open or hallways or windows and that destroys the pressurization and also allows for intrusion of moisture into your building envelope. So it sounds, maybe that's like, wow, you know, why would I care about that? But how many times I've seen that where folks have windows open or they have doors wide open, you can feel the air blowing around the building. In healthcare, we should keep it nice and tight and keep, keep things closed. It sounds strange, but it's simple, but that does happen a lot where people just open doors and windows without thinking about it. Mike, what role does uh, humidity have in, uh, in that equation about the air? Uh, oh, because, I, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that certain pathogens grow exponentially in different humidity levels. Yeah, this is a big conversation we're having in our industry right now. Um, you know, low, low humidity levels are a problem. High humidity levels are a problem. There's a range that seems to be like the sweet spot, which is 30 to 60%. You know, there's some that say it's like right around 42% is like the sweet spot for limiting growth. And, and keep in mind that when air is dry, 
things will travel farther. So when you sneeze, the distance it will travel, and I have some charts where they'll show you how far it will travel when the air is dry versus when it's moist, the sneeze or the cough or the breathing attaches to that moisture and it falls out of the air very quickly. So there's a lot of issues around hydration. Some people call it like air hydration versus humidity. Um, but there's a big subject, even storing supplies in rooms that have humidity that's too low can be an issue because the packaging requires a certain level. And in some healthcare, we allow down to 10%. So a lot of conversation going on around this subject, but 30 to 60% is a really good range that we know is pretty solid. I would add to that when it comes to uh, the environmental services department, Mm -hmm. Controlling the dust in a building is essential. If you've ever seen sunlight coming through an, a window in the afternoon, you see those particles of dust that are free floating and uh, dust settles at the rate of about uh, two feet an hour. And so I think that we, we have kind of uh, forgotten about dust control and that's how things will travel you know these bacteria viruses don't have uh, feet or wings uh, they travel on dust particles and so we have to do a better job of dust removal and uh, that means high dust and low dust so uh, the high dust you know you get these uh, vents in the ceiling that are blowing uh, you know filtered air into the room, but a lot of times you see the, the dust accumulating on tops of TVs and uh, horizontal surfaces. And so we have to remove that dust and with the dust goes the bad guys. So uh, we have to do a better job of controlling the, uh, the dust on horizontal surfaces. And of course the floor is the biggest uh, surface, horizontal surface in that room. And um, if you ever want to uh, get a little bit of a fright, then uh, take a uh, LED flashlight into a um, room that has been processed by uh, EVS and start looking along the baseboards at the floor level at the dust that did not get removed. And every time a door opens into that room, uh, that dust is uh, redistributed in the room. So uh, we in environmental services need to do a better job of dust collection. And if you're gonna use a HEPA filtrated uh, vacuum cleaner, you have to uh, change those filters according to uh, the manufacturer's recommendations and keep that HEPA filtration clean and effective. All right, thank you. Um, next question is about faucet type. Does faucet mm. type encourage or discourage hand washing? For instance, is an automatic sink more likely to be used? Is a turn knob less likely to be used? How does that impact um, hand washing and hand hygiene? Um, you know, one of the things I've read recently, and it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's kind of a contradictory situation, but the, the hands-free type sinks have a lot more mechanical moving parts inside of them. And therefore, there are places higher potential for growth. And whereas the mechanical sinks have fewer moving parts, and so they tend to put out, again, cleaner water, if you will. So we're having this conversation right now. I mean, behavior, human behavior is interesting. I mean, I would think that possibly if it works well and consistently, I don't know if you've ever gone to some of these um, sinks where you, you have to get close to it and you're kind of like moving your hand around <laughs> trying to find it. Or if you, if you do do it, it goes off right away. You know, it can be very frustrating if the sink's not set properly and folks won't won't use it. So I think that's behavior and how the sink operates is a big part of it. But like I said, we're having a conversation about whether or not we've actually added some problems by having these hands-free sinks. Um, so tough, tough question. Good question, but tough question. All right. Um, okay. I just want to encourage everyone that they can submit questions through the Q&A. Um, we'll wait for a few more to roll in. Um, Daryl and Mike, if you have anything you wanted to expand on in your slides, now would be a good time to go ahead and do that. Well, as the past president of the Healthcare Services Institute, uh, it's a nonprofit and I'm not promoting it, but we really look at the role that surface selection plays 
in uh, the clean ability in healthcare. And uh, when you go into a newly remodeled uh, patient care area and you walk up to the nurse's station, here's a nice granite uh, countertop at the nurse's station. Um, <laughs> That is not the right surface for, uh, for healthcare, really, because just think about that granite was in the ground and water was running through it. And so once water gets into uh, that granite surface, you know, that gets wiped routinely, uh, you know, with cleaners, disinfectants, once it gets into it, uh, you know, it can begin to grow things and you can't, you know, disinfectants then won't reach uh, deep down into that, uh, that surface. But that's just one example. And uh, stainless steel in, in hospitals seems, to, especially in the operating room, surgical areas, seems to be the surface of choice. But uh, if you look at the stainless steel that's been installed and six months after it's been installed, look at a micrograph of that stainless steel, you'll see the pits and the valleys where uh, microbes, uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, you can fit all the coronavirus in the world, all the virus, coronavirus in the world in a soda can, uh, it doesn't take a very much of an opening for viral uh, particles to settle into things like stainless steel. And uh, so you need to consider, uh, finishes and uh, furnishings. And uh, we have soft surfaces in, in these patient rooms. And the, the one that is most critical, I believe, is that patient mattress, because it is a soft surface. And for years, we have used disinfectants on those uh, mattresses. And uh, within six months after that has happened, uh, you can get strike through in those mattresses. And that's why the Joint Commission has put it on their list for you to inspect the mattresses at each discharge terminal cleaning. And you should keep a record of that because mattresses uh, have been implicated, you know, through FDA that uh, these mattresses have had events where patients have uh, gotten blood from the mattress up through, uh, and onto their skin because of these, the disinfectants, the body fluids and uh, on that bed. And you cannot disinfect that mattress. You can only uh, at best sanitize it. But the FDA has got a list of uh, instructions that are not the same as the manufacturer's IFUs. So you need to look at the manufacturer's IFU. Some of them say do not allow the disinfectant to pool on that surface because it will damage it. And uh, hospitals are spending a lot of money on mattress replacement because once a year you're supposed to unzip that mattress and inspect underneath in that uh, the core underneath that mattress cover. And you will see uh, discolored foam and it could be blood, it could be any number of body fluids and or disinfectants. And when a patient lies down on that mattress, if it went, went, went through one way, it'll come out through the same way. So uh, you need to keep, uh, keep an eye on how you are processing those mattresses. And if you do it the way the, the FDA recommends, you're basically following that uh, six step uh, process that I showed you earlier about cleaning and, and then disinfecting and rinsing as a final step. All right, thanks, Daryl. Um, someone has a question about ATP meters. Um, can one really trust ATP readings? Do they not just measure microbes alive or dead? They don't measure microbes, they measure living uh, organisms or dead organisms. It can be a dead organism, but if I take an apple and cut it in half and rub it on a surface and then use ATP, uh, I can get counts of 3000 on a surface. And, uh, but is that, uh, is that apple juice, uh, you know, contaminants, you know, so you don't know what is in the makeup of whatever reading. 
all you're measuring is just a snapshot in time and you could do ATP testing, swabbing on a surface, you know, two by two surface, and then six inches away is a totally different picture. So uh, it is the best that we have, but it's not good enough. And uh, I think that that ought to be a part of your program, but it's only for auditing. It's not for verifying that a surface has been properly processed. All it is is an audit and not a verification. So as you audit, uh, it should be used for training uh, purposes so that you, know, you share those results with your staff and you show the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, you know what you should use it for would be in uh, in training, and it's better than than just a visual inspection. But uh, we need better technology for validating that a room has been uh, is hygienically clean. All right. Um, let's see. Someone. Following up to that, Daryl, someone says that so ATP testing should be done almost immediately after the area has been cleaned, is what you're what they understood from that. Yes, and one of the things that I haven't addressed is the issue of biofilm on surfaces. And biofilm is this thick matrix that uh, will form on things, and you know, disinfectants will not. Uh, kill the biofilm. The biofilm is this tough, hard matrix that if it's not disturbed with the right microfiber, uh, steam cleaning is another way to get rid of biofilm. But if you just wipe it with a disinfectant and, and if nothing else touched that and you came back four hours later, you would get different ATP readings because uh, if you do it immediately after the cleaning is done, you come back in four hours and uh, the bacteria, the viruses in that biofilm have repopulated that surface. So that's why I go through those uh, steps of hygienically clean, because you have to disrupt that biofilm with that elbow grease and with the right microfiber products and or steam in order to disrupt that biofilm. People say, well, if I use the right disinfectant, then it will kill the biofilm. You can grow biofilm in a bottle of a uh, quaternary ammonium compound disinfectant, you know, and that's why, you know, the manufacturers suggest that you don't just top off your disinfectants, but that you dump them and you triple rinse the bottles and try to eliminate that biofilm that can begin to grow in a disinfectant bottle. So uh, it is something that is, uh, relatively unstudied when it comes to uh, hygienically cleaning uh, patient care areas, but it's very important. Okay. Uh, someone had a question. You were talking about dusting earlier, um, Daryl. says, although I agree the dusting is essential, once the dust has settled on the horizontal surface, isn't it too late to be effective at mitigating the transmission of microbes in the air? except for the movement of people, just people being in the room, moving around the room will settle, will uh, disrupt that, that dust. And, you know, even this if is, you- Yeah, this is also one of the things where we talk about fans a lot, you know, should you have fans? Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But just the, the fact that people are in and out of the room, you know, if you ever sit and visit with someone that's a patient and you see, you know, eight to 10 people coming in and out of the room in the hour long that you're there. And so stuff is getting stirred up in that room. And uh, if we don't do a better job of dust removal, and, and Mike talked about the HVAC, uh, but um, you know, depending on where the, um, where the space is, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, when you get, when you look at the number of air exchanges, Mike, you know, in the OR, it's so much higher than it is other areas. But uh, when you get into a small space like a patient's bathroom, there's very little air exchange in there. And uh, so 
I think that we need uh, to understand uh, the movement of air and how that dust gets uh, redistributed around the building and gets picked up. And that's why MRSA can be, uh, can be sampled in rooms where there were no MRSA patients. And it's traveling on the, the uniforms of uh, caregivers going from one patient to the next, but it's also carried in, in dust, I believe, from, uh, from room to room and redistributed. And uh, those privacy curtains hanging by the, the patient's bed, you can put up a brand new clean curtain and you can go back and test it uh, 14 days later. And with no MRSA patients in there, you will find MRSA on those curtains, along with VRE and uh, C. diff has also been sampled. So, you know, that's another caveat is that you have to exchange those curtains more frequently. But once you determine what that frequency ought to be, people say, well, we do it once a year or when they're visibly soiled. Well, I just explained to you that a brand new curtain hung up in that space uh, can be contaminated within 14 days because think of the people that go in and out of that room and touch that curtain and uh, then, you know, take care of the patient. And so uh, curtains is another uh, soft surface that needs to be uh, evaluated. But whatever your, whatever your exchange policy is, you have to have the record keeping that goes along with that. If you say that we're going to change our curtains quarterly, then you have to have validation that you're following your own policy. All right, thank you. Um, about air exchange, someone said, if, if there is a little to no air exchange in an area, how long does it typically take spores to settle? Do we? Yeah, well, I think I think the, the answer there is that if you don't have air exchange or return, you get a stuffy room that's going to build up dust and moisture. So that's a mistake we often make is we modify spaces and we put a supply, but we don't put a return or an exhaust. And a return takes it back to the air handle, exhaust takes it out of the building directly. And so it's very important to have some sort of return or an exhaust. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll accommodate that by cutting a hole in the door, putting a grill or raising the undercut to get some sort of air movement. You really need air movement to keep the air from becoming stale. And so the question I think is more tied around, you really need, if you have a space that um, is critical of any kind, in any kind of way, there needs to be some kind of return exhaust or something to vent that space so air can move in exchange. Okay. Um, back to sinks. Um, mm -hmm. This person says, I find many sinks run cold water for a long time. Mm. Uh, what is the temperature range recommended for sinks? Well, if you're a long-term residential extent, it could be 110, 115, possibly to avoid scalding. In hospitals, it's 125 Fahrenheit. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, 140 degrees is what you need to essentially treat for disease or for bacteria like Legionella in the system, but that's too hot to scald folks. So it's a complicated issue. Um, what the proper sink temperature should be. The biggest issue comes with warm water is do you have a good recirculation system and is that set properly? You know, how far are you from where that water is circulating? So uh, that, again, plumbing is another big area of complexity that really is building to building to building and system to system to system. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's 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 my background on, on water Mike, systems. Mike, are you aware that, yeah. um, I believe it was CDC came out with a study that mm -hmm. said that um, warm water hand washing is not, and necessary that cool water, you know, with the right friction, soap, time, all that is uh, just as effective? Uh, I believe that. I, I can see how that's true, but no, I'm not familiar with the study. Yeah. Again, to, as you would agree, it's more about how you wash your hands right. as much as it, it, it's more about that than it is really even about the water temperature. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, this is kind of a broad question, but um, what are your thoughts on products that claim to continue disinfecting for days? Do you think this hmm. is actually working? <laughs> Some of those claims are for bacteria only. And um, 
So I'm aware of uh, a couple that have viral claims, uh, but I think the viral was only for um, COVID-19. And uh, there are viruses that are much tougher to kill than uh, COVID. COVID-19 is a coronavirus and is uh, can be um, disabled with soap and water um, because it, it has an envelope on it that soap uh, breaks down that envelope and makes the uh, the core susceptible to uh, to the water and the the mechanical action of washing your hands whereas uh, some of these like norovirus and uh, adenovirus and RSV uh, are much tougher to kill so I think that EPA is allowing uh, claims to be put on labels, but I don't think that any of, of uh, those EPA is allowing greater than a 24 hour period, even though the studies may show that it can last for 30 days, 60 days, 180 days. I mean, some uh, manufacturers of these antimicrobial coatings are claiming that, uh, you know, a year. And I just don't know, uh, I don't know <laughs> how you validate that it's beyond 24 hours. And so that's why I think EPA is hesitant to give it a longer kill activity than uh, 24 hours. Okay. All right, it looks like we have time for one or two more questions. Um, we have one here back to ATP meters. Um, if you, um, if you are assuring sanitization, wouldn't any protein be an indication of incomplete process? Therefore, doesn't the ATP test process make for the best available protein sanitation test? It's the best that we have. And um, like I said, it's just a snapshot in time and it's a, it's a, like I said, it's an audit. It's not a validation because you can't uh, bring validity to the entire room uh, from that one ATP uh, test that you took. And um, CDC lists about 19 different uh, high touch surfaces in a patient room. And uh, you can't, because of the cost of the, the swabs, it becomes cost prohibitive to, uh, to test all of those uh, surfaces and you might do one room <laughs> and then you're done, you know, if you do all 19. But uh, you need to be more intentional about where and when and how often you do that. And you need to uh, not make it punitive for the employee uh, because some, uh, Unions and hospitals uh, think that it's a gotcha sort of moment for uh, management to beat up on the, the employees, the staff. And uh, so, you know, you, you need to be uh, cautious about how you use it, but um, it is the best that we have. And I wouldn't suggest that you stop it. Another way would be uh, with the UV markings uh, that are relatively invisible to the naked eye, but that's another way, but it's not going to give you some sort of account. You'll either, you have to go into the room before it's clean, mark certain surfaces, and then uh, immediately after the room is clean, go in and with the black light, uh, look for those surfaces being uh, cleaned and uh, the marks removed. But, uh, the caution about that is as soon as the EVS employees find out that, you know, a black light shows these marks and everyone's got a black light in their pocket and they're looking for the marks and they're going around and cleaning the marks. And um, so it's an imperfect uh, world that we live in and uh, we have to do the best that we can with the tools that we have, but it's not a gotcha on the employees. It's meant to uh, improve your processes and if we don't measure it, then we can't improve it. So it is a, a, a form of measuring clean. And you know we need to be more intentional about measuring our outcomes. 
the people, the process, and the products. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, Daryl. Um, I was just gonna say any final words uh, you and Mike have, let's go ahead and um, have some final thoughts and then I'll, we'll wrap, wrap it up for the day. Um, Mike, any final thoughts you'd like to say on the, on the topics discussed today? Well, I went pretty fast over that content. One clarification, patient rooms have no requirement for differential air movement directionally. That's very important. I don't want folks to walk away thinking patient room doors have to be kept closed. Uh, typically, it's just when there is some sort of a either protecting something that's very clean or protecting, you know, something that is um, soil, like soil utility rooms, things like that. Those have the differentials where you really have to keep those doors closed. I want to make sure I clarify that. I want to point out, too, that the outpatient environment, you know, we think about acute care an awful lot, but we've seen lots of issues now in the outpatient environment because we ambulate a lot of patients who are not well, fully well when they leave. They're immunocompromised. So we've, we've kind of slacked off in the outpatient world. Um, and that's become a big emphasis and focus in those areas. So you can't relax when you get to those, those occupancies as well. Um, I think the last thing I probably mentioned again is reiterate the implications of moisture, you know, wet things and, and building intrusion of water. Those, that's one of the big areas we have to continue to work on and work together on. Um, so I'd leave it at that. Thank you, Mike. And, and Daryl, any last words from you? Well, I think the last 18 months has given us uh, COVID tunnel vision when it comes to uh, cleaning and disinfection. And when we're looking for a disinfectant, we're looking for an in-list uh, EPA product. And there's about 580 products on that list in that have been approved for um, not COVID hasn't been tested, but the organisms have been tested that validate that, you know, it's for emerging pathogens as well as COVID. But, um, you know, we've gotten COVID vision. In the meantime, MRSA has, uh, the rates of HAI, MRSA in hospitals has jumped 32% in the last year while we were watching COVID and using disinfectants that had a COVID claim to them and uh, weren't necessarily efficacious against some of the other organisms in healthcare. And uh, so we have seen this, you know, all of our gains from the previous five or six years wiped out in one year because we were tunnel vision on COVID. So I encourage everyone to take your glasses off and uh, let's go after keeping the patients and staff uh, alive and well in hospitals. And my last thought is that one uh, environmental services aid that is engaged is given the right education, the right tools, the right equipment, the right products, and the right amount of time will prevent more infections than a room full of doctors can cure. All right. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks everyone for your questions. Before we conclude, I'd like to thank our webinar sponsors, Cascades Pro, TBS Capital Funding, and Steramis by Tomi Environmental Solutions, and our expert presenters, Daryl and Mike. Um, all of you will receive an email with a link to the video recording of this presentation by the end of this week. And we will also post it on our website at cmmonline.com. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great and safe afternoon.